think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Well, I'm of a generation that can remember the UK being outside. And while it wasn't all sweetness and light by any stretch of the imagination, government in those days didn't ever have an easy ride. That place stopped learning how to govern. And it's pretty manifest right now because I, there are so many divided factions in there that none of them can agree even what day it is, much less something as enormous as, as, as Brexit. Brexit. Is it really the will of the people? Since the 2016 referendum, the British Parliament has debated, but has yet failed to deliver the 52% vote to leave from the UK electorate. Brexit is arguably the biggest single hot potato since World War II and continues to divide politicians and every man, woman and child in this country. So it's my mission, should I choose to accept it, to gather people's opinions on the streets to find out from them what Brexit really means. I'm just a visitor, believe it or not, I'm one of the millions of tourists. My name is Brian Johns, I live in St Albans, which is about 20 miles outside London. So because I'm on my own now, I come up periodically and mix in, see the sights. As I said, there's so much I haven't seen, along with probably millions of other Brits. Uh, my name's Sullivan Thomas, West London, born in Clapham, lived most of my life at White City, now I live in Holland Park, which is a, a nice part of town. I am from Norway, I've lived here for 14 years. Um, and I'm working here as a freelance photographer. So my name is Dilpreet, uh, Dilpreet Brar. I work in blockchain technology at this uh, company called Conduent, which is a spin-off of Xerox. And before this, I've worked nine years in banking at Standard Chartered Bank. And I've come into London in 2017, after three decades of my life in India, in Mumbai. We don't vote here, so we are not English. We don't have English passports. So we live here entirely based on the European Union and the EEA. Uh, yeah, I come from Germany and yeah, I'm here for holidays. My name is Simon. I am half Italian, half English, born and raised in Milan. I came to live in London in the end of 2012. Well, uh, my name is Mariana Heglasikova. I've lived in London for about 17 years now. Well, I started working as a waitress. I did it for 10 years um, and now I'm working in a casino as a dealer. My name is Lam. Um, I've lived in the UK for about over 30 years now. Uh, I grew up in, in this country. Originally I'm from Vietnam, but I'm more British than anything. For the majority of people living in Britain, June the 23rd, 2016 will go down in history. That was the date UK citizens voted whether to remain or to leave the European Union after first joining way back in 1973. 51.9% chose to leave. What does the UK public really think about Brexit? Brexit, I think, is an identity question. It's whether we want to be part of a wider European community or whether we want to be uh, an island nation on our own. Well, personally, I guess Brexit means to me um, a period of confusion. You know, there is, we've had two and a half years of rhetoric around whether or not we leave with a deal or without a deal, the implications of that, whether, how that's going to affect business, small business, large business, how it affects our banking, you know, whether or not we're suddenly going to be in a free fall where the euro becomes much stronger against the pound. So when we're looking to go on holiday next year, Suddenly, we've not got quite so much money. I think probably it will be more difficult for them uh, because uh, nowadays more and more Hungarians are, are coming to work and live here. 
so maybe it will be difficult uh, to enter the country for them. But uh, I, I'm afraid it will be more difficult for those who, who are only tourists. And uh, it would be really sad. Uh, because uh, now it's, uh, it's, uh, very, it's a very good thing that without too much bureaucracy you can enter the country, have a look around and go home without uh, too many bureaucratic uh, steps. So I'm, I, I think it, it would be a really pity uh, if um, tourism would be, um, would be made harder. For my own part, with uh, three children and hopefully grandchildren in the future, I think it would be much better to be part of the wider European community, but still having links to the US, the Far East, Africa, Asia, and all the rest of the world. So I remember hearing about it the first time in 2016 and when the referendum um, had just come about and I think it was around July 2016 we started hearing that there's Britain would like to separate itself from EU. It was a shockwave all around. So I'm here with Mr Neville Sheen, Chief Executive Officer of UK telecommunications company Cortel based in London. Personally, I, I, I voted for Brexit. I think it's a good idea. I think it'd be good to get out of Europe. I think they're restricting our trading. I don't think they're doing any, any good for us. It's a very left-wing organisation, in my opinion. It's, it's run by people that are not elected, that we're not voting for. So, couldn't wait to get out. If you take um, um, industry, economics, politics in consideration, um, England or the UK is a more independent country. And uh, I think uh, they can get, uh, get by without, uh, without the European Union. So I don't think it will, be, it will be a big difference for them. At least for the first couple of years, it's going to be a big problem for the country in many, many sectors, if not most of them. It's, reasons why, it's good reasons to leave, and it's a lot too many good reasons to stay. Uh, business, jobs, what were they thinking, you know, when they were voting? A lot of people said they hadn't even gone to vote. So that's when we realized that, you know, it's, it's not something that represents truly UK. I first of all think, what is it that they, the people that vote for Brexit believe is going to change for the better? What is it that they want? Do they think that pushing out every single European that lives here, the country is going to be better? Do they think that it's going to cost less money? No, because suddenly you're slammed with taxes, border control, immigration, uh, people like myself, my husband, probably leaving. What does that mean for the British economy? Hopefully it won't be more expensive. It, it might be just, um, it might not be that easy to come into the country or maybe I will have to go through a different, you know, at the airports, through the different entrance and to check my background, whether I am allowed to enter, enter the country or not. So I will have to, you know, prove myself since I'm not a holder of British passport. I think the EU or the European common market was a brilliant idea. In winter heat, through the door open to the public then I voted in favour because I saw open borders it's a win-win situation we can go where we like we can work where we like and vice versa and um, it was a brilliant idea gone wrong uh, I feel that there's going to be some sort of possibly general little panic uh, I hear about problems with imports and exports and tariffs uh, going towards the WTO, uh, how do you call it in English, uh, standard deals. I think that will pose some problems in the first couple of years, but I do believe that knowing England a bit, uh, you will pull out of it in a, in a good way and in maybe three, four or five years uh, it's going to be okay, if not even maybe not as good as before, but good enough. Well, I'm worried mostly about the prices of food because uh, if there's no deal, I guess we're going to pay higher taxes for import, export. So, um, yeah, well, I don't see the wages coming up. Start getting passports. Um, at the moment, we just need our IDs 
for traveling here um, because the UK is still in the um, EU. Um, that's very convenient for us. Um, that's because we are um, in an apprenticeship and we don't have that money um, to get a passport. I am a Brexiteer. I want to get out because, as I said, I remember this country pre-Brexit and how dynamic it could be. But on the other side, for businesses, that's going to be a huge amount of uncertainty because where if they're buying from Europe or selling into Europe, there's no control over what that's going to mean. Well, it means a closure of something, um, mostly closed borders. I've got the right to stay after 17 years. I have to make the decision whether to apply for the passport or whether um, the um, what do you call it? residency card will be enough just to travel into the country. As uh, Brexit will have very big impact to economy, it also will affect to fashion industry and it's not a good impact because the prices will go up um, because if the uh, immigrants or Europeans have to leave the UK and uh, companies will have to hire uh, locals and it will be different salaries. Something that Tony Blair said resonates well with me that as time passes by over the next four or five decades, China, India, these will sort of become the superpowers in the world. And the strength of developed economies, which we know right now, Germany, UK, uh, Americas, that will sort of go down. It will become a lot more uh, balanced. Strength of uh, global economy will shift more towards East. And when you have such a scenario playing out, you need a collective bargaining power. And probably a lot of people say that UK indeed has shot itself in the foot by reducing its collective bargaining power because now, over the next uh, 15 years, maybe two or three decades, your bargaining power in terms of trade relationships, financial relationships with your counterparts will definitely diminish. It means it makes it more, much more difficult to get to London, for example, or other countries in uh, the United Kingdom. And I don't think that is a, I don't think that's good. Not good for me and not good for everyone else. What will happen to a lot of goods that are being transported across borders what will happen to all the people from EU who are in UK right now and the UK people who are in Europe right now? Will they be able to stay, not stay? What happens to their passporting rights and all of that? I think it's quite a difficult one for me because I am Norwegian, but I live here. I'm married to a Polish man and we have a child that's born here. So we are basically very European. And for us to hear that this country wants to leave the European Union, is first of all ex extremely disappointing for us um, because we built the life here and we wonder does that mean that we are not more welcome here by 50% of the people that live here? Um, what does it mean for us when we want to buy a house? What does it mean for our child? And um, there's quite a few questions that's going through our minds and we're also wondering people are talking about Brexit in Norway they're saying we could be like the new Norway. But in my experience, I don't think that's what England wants. The reason being is that Norway has the European Union, but they have to, they have no say. They pay a lot of money to be part of the European economic area, but they have very little say in what that means for the country. We still have to take a lot of the goods. We still have to imply with lots of the rules. I don't think it will be what the Brexiteers really want for Brexit. Even in banking, we were struggling to just figure out that, you know, what will happen to a lot of companies who earlier had passporting rights and now they will not have those negotiating powers. What becomes of the financial contracts as well? And London has always been a hub of, uh, you know, global currency trading. Like I, it's probably the currency trading capital of the world, right? The power from a financial perspective will diminish eventually. Brexit means to me is what they said, leave or stay. And Brexit means leave. Now I voted to stay. I think the social and economic consequences of an no deal Brexit are going to be so difficult for a large number of people. Tim Devlin was born in Dublin. 
but now lives and works in London. He is a barrister at Furnival Chambers. Before that, he was a Conservative Member of Parliament. With a no-deal Brexit, he is very aware of the problems that could occur gathering legal evidence. The most important uh, thing that we are looking at in terms of a no-deal Brexit is what is going to happen to the European arrest warrant. This is a procedure which is agreed to by all 28 European countries by which someone who commits an offence in one country uh, can be arrested in another country and brought automatically back. Uh, if we no longer have the European arrest warrant after a no-deal Brexit, that will mean that uh, Britain would have to formally apply for extradition for a criminal who had come to the United Kingdom and committed an offence here. The second area that is going to be impacted in a, in a very significant way is police cooperation, because at the moment uh, the British uh, uh, police have automatic access to Europol, uh, by which they can simply submit fingerprints uh, and or photographs to uh, Europol and they will be told within a matter of hours what the real identity of the person is that they're dealing with and also what offences they have committed before. Uh, a third area that is important to us is the area of joint investigation teams which is where police uh, in say two different or three different European countries jointly investigate uh, a group of people or an individual who is committing crimes across national borders. Uh, at the moment, uh, in this country, that's chiefly used for internet crime, uh, fraud and uh, narcotics, which are moved from one country to another. And the last, and I think probably a significant area of cooperation, is uh, in how uh, British nationals are dealt with and held in other EU countries. Uh, at the moment, there are um, exchange rights, so that if you're imprisoned, in one country, you can be swapped back to your home country. Uh, equally, uh, there are um, available to the British government redress if uh, the rights of British nationals in, say, Spain or Portugal or another Eastern European country are traduced in some way, uh, they can um, protest to the European Court of Human Rights. And this will have an impact on the British courts because the, the sorts of cases, transnational cases which are brought to court at the moment, are possibly uh, at risk of being hindered by a no-deal Brexit. But my understanding of it is that everybody is just going to continue after Brexit, uh, doing exactly what they're doing at the moment until they're told not to. But the, uh, we all await to see what uh, people on the other side of the uh, of the channel will do because of course there is a common travel area with Ireland so we already have a quite prior to joining the EU we had an arrangement with the Irish government that uh, there would be joint investigations and cooperation so that's not going to be affected what we're really waiting to see now is whether or not uh, people, countries on the other side of the channel are going to make uh, change to the arrangements. I, I think the likelihood is that cooperation between police forces will continue until somebody tells them not to and we'll have to wait and see what uh, line the EU takes with regard to crime. I don't know much about the uh, EU arrest warrant but I don't see why we wouldn't be able to get someone arrested and extradited just like we do with the states or other places now so I'm sure that will be set up. Why wouldn't it be? It makes no sense not to do that. I don't think the politicians pushing a no-deal Brexit are being honest with people. And I think they're selling a populist message uh, and therefore people don't realise how bad it's going to be. Britain is a proud trading nation. We have a good democratic and legal system. So eventually we'll come through it. But I think we're going to have five years of trauma. I think there's going to be a generation that are never going to recover from it. Carrie James runs Benedict Mackenzie a firm specialising in offering administration and liquidation services for companies. 
for us as insolvency practitioners, the, as with many other professions, there's no contingent or doesn't appear to be any contingency at the moment about how inter-European laws work. So at the moment, if we've started those proceedings in, the U in England, we can automatically open proceedings in Germany under European law. Whereas the, so there's no certainty around how that will happen or how those, that sort of mutual understanding and workings will happen after Brexit. From the perspective of running an insolvency practice, what we don't know is what the implications will mean to small businesses. So we work generally with small, medium enterprises where small directors, so they're family businesses, small, you know, they could be retail, it could be manufacturing. They are suddenly going to be are continuing to work in a period of uncertainty. So because they don't know what the implication may be on um, pricing or customers or staffing levels, so if they're reliant on cross on staff coming in from, from Europe to support their businesses seasonally or, or for longer periods, that because they can't plan around that, what they don't know is how that's going to affect their business. So they are trying, they, as we get closer, I guess they're planning um, around how we would, uh, how they may make their businesses more certain or more robust. But what they don't know is actually what the financial implication could be and whether or not they have any sort of sufficient reserves or funding to make that happen. Now, that may lead to an increase in pressure on businesses, so we may see an increase in insolvencies. Undoubtedly, we will see an increase. Actually, it's not good for the overall economy. And what we need as an economy is for entrepreneurs to succeed. We need businesses, small businesses, to succeed as a foundation for our economic stability. Now, there's a degree that, okay, there, that there will be increased insolvency, but what we need to make sure is that's as part of a process of recovery so we don't just have it draw into a close. So we don't have a free fall where we've got a huge, a, a large amount of insolvencies, but there's no recovery. There's nowhere for these small businesses to go. So you know, we need to make sure that as much as they use the right procedures when they can't continue, there is some advantage in them in continuing or recovering or rescuing or using the insolvency procedures that are there to rescue businesses, not just to bring it to a close. Certainly there's work to be done in the, in the next sort of September, October for businesses to start planning and start considering what their contingencies are and what they should be looking at to safeguard themselves of the unknown. I think we're going to have five years where we're going to have such difficulty dealing with the, bre the consequences of Brexit on the economy. It's going to be extremely difficult to face all the other global macroeconomic impacts that are going to impact on the UK. It, it will make virtually no difference to us. I mean, it, if anything, it could improve our lives. I mean, most of our equipment, I mean, comes from either the UK, uh, Korea, America, virtually nothing from Europe anymore. So I think it'd be good for us, uh, for the telecommunications industry as a well. whole. Um, I mean, there's a bit of worries about, there's roaming agreements in Europe for telecoms that are, that are actually at your, your home tariff goes with you now on the mobile side. But um, I think they'll say, I think they'd be very unwise to take that away now they've set it up. Why would they? I don't think it makes any difference. I think it will be just as it was. Um, and generally on trading, I think we'll do better. Um, stuff coming from Korea, we'll probably get a better deal. Things from China, Hawaii, we'll probably start doing more business with them. So they're Chinese. Um, obviously Apple. Apple already have everything established now. Um, yeah, it won't make much difference on, on mobile. won't make much difference on UK products. So I think it should be good for us. It's our third day on the streets of London and we're outside the Bank of England to get the opinion of the bankers and the financial wizards as to what Brexit means to them.
But guess what? They're keeping stomp, preferring to adhere to the corporate official policy of the banks. The referendum had been called by former Prime Minister David Cameron, possibly to silence the growing anti-European voice and movement. Most people were expecting a decision to remain, and so were genuinely surprised with the result. And indeed, David Cameron resigned the following day. But as I said, Brexit now is very confused. I think there was inherently a lack of information because people just didn't know. But I also think there was a lot of disinformation where politicians who were pushing the Brexit line knew some of the difficulties that were going to be faced, but were uh, subsuming them in a, in a marketing cell for Brexit. Uh, I think if, uh, you know, they, they dodge the difficult questions. If you ask any of the Brexit politicians now, how many people are going to be made redundant? How many people are going to lose their jobs? How many people are going to be economically, financially worse off in the next 12 to 18 months? They'll, they'll skirt the question, they won't tell you. Uh, they know how difficult, they have an idea how difficult it's going to be. We're woefully unprepared in all areas of, uh, of life, all areas of the economy. And um, I think it's going to be a real shock to the system. I think we'll get through it. But as I say, I think it's going to be several years of real hardship. And as usual, it's going to be the less well off, the, you know, the less well educated that are really going to suffer. Uh, and I think the Brexit people, I think, lied as well. I think they, they were not telling the whole truth and people didn't get the full information. I think Brexit was a protest vote by people, not an actual vote for to leave you know, it was a protest vote that I think went wrong. I don't think it was. I mean, it was a, a leave or stay and people voted to leave. I, I, I can't see where misinformation came from. I really can't. If people voted now, I don't, with all the facts, and all the things that we know now, there was no way we would, people would leave the, want to leave the European Union. Because there is a lack of information coming out of government, we, the, because the government, it's obviously, it tells us it's planning. <laughs> and particularly we've seen, you know, in the press this week, information about their, their, you know, their fallout of Brexit planning, but we've not seen that in the business community. So actually businesses aren't getting any information from government. Uh, Everybody said uh, on the bus, oh, we're going to give £350 million to... It didn't say that, it said we'd save £350 million and we could look after the NHS better. They never said it was going to give them £350 million. And uh, I think we've got the right man now as Prime Minister. No, I definitely think uh, the information was uh, not complete or even wrong in some cases. So people voted, many people voted because they thought uh, it would have been one way, but it's probably going to be much more complicated than they believed so. I think it was a very good campaign in that they certainly persuaded people on certain points. I don't think there was anywhere near sufficient information. And I don't think they actually gave sufficient information to small businesses about what the implication was on them. So I don't think small businesses understood that if there was no VAT planning, what would happen to their businesses? So you know, where they reliant on the moment into Europe, then there's no VAT. I don't think that was uh, an implication was put forward. I don't think people considered what would happen when they go on holiday, what would happen to, uh, you know, Sterling. I think when, when we travel abroad, I think it was all based on the fact of pulling on people's heartstrings about uh, very good headlines. None of it was actually about, you know, uh, real implications. So one side was quite happy to say, we're going to have all this money because we're going to not pay Europe, but completely happy to ignore the money that we actually received and the implication that had in you know, infrastructure in outside of, you know, sort of central England, how you know, businesses need those, that, that sort of inf money to survive. So, you know, there's been funding put into small businesses through the European bank that will now disappear. I actually think most people before the referendum had already made up their mind. I don't think the information that was being fed out 
made that much difference. It was a little bit misleading about the 350 million a week, but that was the headline figure. And it was a true figure. It just wasn't a net figure. That's fair enough. I mean, no one, nobody of any kind of intelligence thought that that was exactly what we're paying and we're getting nothing back. I don't think very few people thought that that was the only amount of money involved. Yeah, money's coming back, but it was still probably 160, 170 million net loss. For what? To be in, in the customs union, um, you know, that's a two-way street. Um, we'll get a deal with Europe at some stage, even if it's not before we leave. Um, later on, they'll want to do a deal. We can then go and do good deals around the world. It's a big place, you know. I think there was a lot of lies or misinformation provided to public, especially about the 320,000 billion to NHS. And two days later, after the referendum, it wasn't true anymore. I'm surprised those people are not in the prison for misinforming the public and influencing their votes. I think Boris will be really good PM, actually. I think he'll do much better than people think. He's, you know, he's got that kind of laid back, jovial way that successful PMs have generally had. You know, they tend to act like they, they take it easy. They don't really, they just put that act on. And it's, you know, to be fair, he's saying to Europe, we're going to go no matter what. You needed to have said that right from the start to get the right deal. Otherwise, they're going to give you and go, well, you'll have what we give you, basically. That's where we are at the moment, isn't it? So I think a no deal Brexit is a bad thing um, for, I think, for the country. I think it's a bad thing for the country, but I think uh, it, it's leading that way. I've got a feeling it's leading that way, unless the European Union changes it changes its mind and that sort of sort of changes its mind about a few things but I think it's leading towards a no-deal Brexit. Clearly uh, I would say that you know the way it has panned out after 2016 and you had Johnson at one point of time stepping back and putting Theresa May forward to sort of try and negotiate with Europe it did not turn out to be so well with EU you sort of came to a structure came to a point where in Theresa May almost created a Brexit, which is not really a Brexit, you try to create as much of status quo as much as possible. And then the hard Brexiters said, you know what, this is not what the referendum alluded to. It should have completely been a divorce. And that's what Boris Johnson has come to now. He says that on 31st of October, we will leave no matter what. I feel they talk more about Brexit in Italy than they do over here. <laughs> Every time I go to Italy, maybe because I live in London, obviously, everybody asks me, uh, what's going on there? Are you okay? Uh, is it going to be okay? How do you feel? How are people coping? And I feel they're more, much more worried actually than, than English people are or people in the UK. In, in the UK, I feel that even though people are, are very worried and they discuss about it a lot, they still manage to uh, get on with their jobs. Uh, in Italy, when these things happen, everybody stops. They can't work anymore. They complain every day, all day. So, uh, yeah, uh, they talk a lot about Brexit in Italy. And I think they are quite worried about it too, obviously. In 2004, we were promised law of our country will be superior to European Union. I don't see that happening anymore. It looks like we're being dictated by European Union, what, what laws we should have, what, um, what food we should sell, what chemicals to add to the food and drinks in order to keep it on within the European standards. The prices went up. We don't see much rise of salaries in Eastern Europe, but the prices went significantly up. If I dare to say up to 100 and 150% which is a bit unbearable when you think people are on average salary 550 euros a month and paying Western European prices for food, it's a lot to handle. You really have to turn your coin twice, whether you're going to spend it or not. So I would say that the middle class is gone. There's only the people going from salary to salary every month or the rich people.
people talk about austerity now, have no idea what austerity really is. I'm a child of the post Second World War generation, growing up in the 50s into the 60s and so on. And life was hard. Um, it really was. And I think if a deal can't be struck, if there is um, the real possibility of a no deal breakfast, uh, Brexit, I beg your pardon, it will impact on lower earners, perhaps than it would for people like me. I'm not sure whether people would leave, but um, I think there is something the European Union government should reconsider. It um, looks like more and more people are really uncomfortable with the kind of dictation, like um, we could see reactions from Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic. They disagreed with certain rules, especially uh, regarding of the immigration and forcing us to take on refugees, which I understand we have to help each other, but we should look after the European Union citizens first, then the refugees. And there's loads of seniors who are who are getting literally post-communist um, pension. And they are on the edge of real poverty and kind of living. We, what I've noticed, Eastern Europe doesn't have enough money to look after their pensioners. And instead of um, European Union helping us to make sure they live on a proper good level, they're forcing us to take on the refugees. We, we, we don't have the financial funds to support refugees and help the seniors. So I don't know, that's, that's just my personal view. So I'm not sure if we're out of it because we already started building together, but there should be big changes coming. They should reconsider the politics they're, they're leading. They're trying to come across with other nations. So we deal with some quite large businesses. Will they feel it? Um, I'm not, I've not been told by any of them. I mean, if we look at a lot of our clients, um, not many of them are dependent on Europe. Not We're just lucky, I think, in that way. But if we lost a few clients or we had a, you know, I mean, nobody wants to see companies going out of business because they've got trading arrangements that have now gone. But they will make other trading arrangements and they will recover, in my opinion, most of them will ride it out. There'll be a rough period and then they'll come back. I think we'll do fine. I mean, at the end of the day, being in Europe, I can't, I still can't understand why you can't do deals anyway. Even though you're in Europe, you, to me, trade in Europe, you trade with Europe with no tariffs. So what is stopping somebody from being in Europe, free trade between Europe, what's stopping you from doing deals elsewhere? It doesn't make sense to me. What do you think of the Irish backstop? It's very difficult. Um, it's a really politically difficult question because I understand the EU and Ireland as part of the EU does not want to, uh, they don't want to have free access across the, the border between Northern Ireland and, and the Irish Republic. But equally, I understand how the British government and people in Northern Ireland don't want to be have a border between Northern Ireland and the UK. It's an intractable problem. It's a Gordian knot, but it's a consequence that comes out of the whole Brexit idea that could have been avoided. The difficulty we are in now is that we're leaving the European Union. Therefore, as a result, we should have hard border. Now, whether a technological solution can be found, but then the Irish border is incredibly long. Parts of it are out of the way. So how do you cover technology with the whole of that? And actually, that's going to have a day-to-day -day impact on people's lives. So if they live in the north and work in the south, how are they, you know, they're constantly going to be monitored. And that really affects their everyday life. At the end of the day, if you can't get this backstop in Ireland sorted out, then it'll have to be a no deal. And the EU are not really giving us anything. I mean, they're, they're stubborn too. And at the end of the day, to me, I'll just turn around and say, well, you, if it's no deal, there's no 39 billion pound. We'll give that to you, NHS. But uh, I think Boris will get something sorted. I think the worrying 
uh, trend at the moment is the increase in violence that Northern Ireland's already seen. And I think for uh, us as a United Kingdom and for separate countries, nobody has a desire to move back to those times. If that is an implication of Brexit, that will be a very sad one. Well, my opinion is simple. I haven't a clue what it's about. And I think, I asked a few friends, and they'd never a clue. I'd say that 95% of the UK don't know what on earth they're talking about. Um, the only thing I ever heard about it or read about it was that it kind of ties us into the customs union, which is the last thing in the world we want. We want to be out of it. And that backstop seems to tie us into it. But I'd say most people don't have a clue, don't know it. Nobody knows what they're talking about. We contacted various EU banks to shed some light on Brexit and their opinions on the Irish backstop but unfortunately, none were available to comment. I, th I think the Brexiteers have been tactically very clever and they've manoeuvred us into a position where I think it's, it's almost impossible now to avoid a no-deal Brexit. I think a no-deal Brexit, once it was on the table, was always a likely outcome because it didn't require anyone to do anything. All the other outcomes require somebody to actually make a decision to do something else. It's very difficult to get consensus to do anything else, whereas a no-deal Brexit almost happens by default. No, I don't think you will. I mean, how can you have a second referendum where we've already had one and they haven't carried it out? And then they go, uh, the people's vote. Well, who voted last time? Agent aliens. It was the people voted. And they haven't carried it. It's the politicians are doing it. Because the politicians don't want to leave, but stopping them leaving. They're not stopping you leaving because of the deal. I just think they just don't want you to go and they're holding you up. I, I still don't think we're coming out on the 31st. I think the risk is that we've got conference period coming up, which is going to take us out of uh, it would take the government out of actual business days in Parliament. So if you actually start to look at how many business, there's 76 days till we leave, but actually if you take that down to how many business days there are in government, Boris actually doesn't have to do very much. I don't want another dithering Prime Minister again, you know, and I hope Parliament sorts themselves out because there's just... They're just a mess at the moment, to tell you. I don't see what he, he's not got a magic sort of, you know, he's not a magic wand that he can suddenly wave. You know, politi we, we've got a completely divided parliament. They neither side, whereas, you know, perhaps historically, we've always been able to do business in that the parties ultimately will come to an agreement to make business happen, which is why, you know, the UK has been open for business historically is because whatever happens in the background or the foreground, our governments at the time have always been able to make business move forward and the country move forward without a majority. Actually, neither side are doing that and we're just seeing stalemate. And they don't seem to be able to work in a bipartisan way to make it happen. The longer it delays, the more uncertainty we have, the more these businesses can't make any decisions because they don't have, they're not in control and they can't know what the outcomes will be. So they can go to European suppliers have nego and negotiate about potentials, but because there's no decision, they can't come up with a solution. So we can continue to see sort of this ebb and throw of buying in stock or buying in services at X price and paying for it now, so we've got it, they've got it post-Brexit. But a delay will only just continue to push those forward and, and constrict cash flow. How long will they delay for? I mean, the Europe's quite seems to be quite strict in that they're not interested in delaying this. So we say they've delayed for another three months, then there's just going to be further infighting in Parliament, presumably, because nobody gets into a decision and we could end up with an election. If we have another referendum, it has to be an informed referendum because actually the Brexit question before was too wide and they didn't think through the simplification of 2% voting either way. They should, you know, there was no boundary of what was, I mean, they went for a simple majority and what the implication was that for that was. So I think if there was enough a referendum, it's got to be in much clearer terms about what that means for the country. I think um, there'll be a, a lot of turmoil afterwards if, if we leave without a deal, which I don't think that's his plan. I think his plan is to just say to Europe, well, we're going to go no matter what. If you want to give us a deal, it'd be better for you. But if you don't, you don't. I mean, the worst thing that happened was everybody 
stabbing Theresa May in the back and saying, oh, yeah, we're going to stop you. You know, we're not going to have a no deal exit. Well, that, I mean, people sitting in Europe must have been laughing their heads off, really thinking they were fighting each other. We don't have to do anything. We're just going to give them, they'll have to accept what we give. Well, yeah, I'm really unhappy about that. I think you need to go in there saying we're ready to walk away. Anyone in business should realise that. Um, but, you know, a lot of people in Parliament are not in business, especially if they're on the Labour side or the Liberals. They, they normally don't understand business very well. But I do think he's much more determined than Theresa May, uh, although we would need to see what the Parliament is going to do. Uh, are they going to help him or not? Uh, I think he really wants to do it and he really believes in it. Uh, but I, I don't know if there's any answer to that question. Um, it's much more probable that he's going to do a no-deal Brexit than May would have done. Because we didn't exit then, they've spent reserves that they may have or may have borrowed to buy those funds. We've now got this period where... Those companies have had to continue trade. It's constrained their money, you know, their cash flow in their businesses, and we're still not out. So after the 31st, um, it could be a situation where actually the reserves they've put in place have been used. They don't have sufficient money to buy stock. The VAT situation isn't resolved, and they're suddenly having to repay the money that they've potentially borrowed for that stock. So that will then see uncertainty in the business and it will see them having risk about how they fund that. I reckon that was six months. And whether we get a deal, or I don't really know. I'm not a politician. But I mean, if the people, to me, if you vote for something, and the winning side should get what you vote for. And we voted to leave and we should leave. You know, I, I voted to stay. But... Uh, for business reasons, mainly, and uh, we should leave. And uh, politicians shouldn't be able to stop it. Well, I hope so. I guess he has to deliver now. He started this fight, he should finish it. I would certainly like to believe that if, some, if it's just about a three month time span, if somebody's got there in a position of power and says that I will do something in three months time frame, then you want to honor such a thing, right? you might change plans when something is let's say three or four year long and things develop over the years and then you realize you know probably it was not a good decision we need to change the course of path but in a three month time span if you cannot stick to your own word then do you have that honor as a statesman i'm not sure but you asked me that you know what is india thinking what is the subcontinent thinking about it what is china probably thinking about it clearly they were just saying that you know uk has to now go through this entire um, massive exercise of negotiating bilateral, bilateral trade agreements and if it doesn't work well with UK on a couple of negotiations, the other countries will learn from that, take advantage of you know, UK's poor bargaining power and use all of those um, points in negotiating further ahead with UK. So that actually points out to the larger economic uh, troubles, especially the debt crisis that UK, that Europe has always had. So I've always believed in this, you know, when I did my MBA, I realized that there are certain people in the classroom who really want to study well. They are the leaders, they put in all the exercise, they put in all the hard work in developing a group activity. And there are certain people who are called free riders, you know, who just want to chill out, have fun. They will still get the same grades. And that's effectively how the world works. When you sort of bring different countries together, not all of them have the same strengths. If you base it on a strengths-based agreement, you know, everybody contributes with their strengths, then a collective whole of different countries can actually be great. But if some countries continue to have a debt problem, you know, they are taking unnecessary risk, productivity doesn't grow, structural reforms are not put in the economy, those countries will end up always spiraling into a debt problem. You know, business and governments will not be able to revive their economies as well. And Europe indeed has seen that, you know, Italy, Italy is facing a banking debt problem right now. Cyprus, Greece, all of these nations have had a debt crisis as well. Tourism is a good thing, great. And I think from that perspective, if you have no borders, it's good for tourism.
but overall i feel that they have always uh, you know when we had the uh, in in spain as well you had uh, noises which wanted to separate out as well so that will continue to happen over the next three or four uh, decades i believe uh, will the euro stay together uh, eurozone stay together it's a question mark but now that they have built it that way ideally they should stay together because that gives you a collective bargaining power when you negotiate with china you negotiate with southeast asia going forward um i would have even thought that by this time uh, in 2000 when we were thinking about you know how will eurozone pan out i would have thought that africa would have also thought about it and wanted to come together as a union but africa's still struggling with its own problems on the politics front and has not had great growth so far so they will probably observe the eurozone as well and think has it been a good story at all and should the african nations come together does it give them any good bargaining power or are they okay to just be separate countries and they will then observe uk and learn from their story that you know what happened when uk separated itself from the eurozone and did it pan out well right. for for uh, uk I think that there's not going to be a second referendum anytime soon. There could be maybe some years down the line. Uh and if there's going to be one I will still vote to remain in Europe or to go back to Europe. The British people have made a choice. We've had a referendum, we've made a choice because just because we made a choice that a lot of people didn't like, you know, we can't go back on that word. We can't go back on the British people have made a choice. We have to leave. I've been watching loads of politicians boycotting Theresa May which was um hilarious it's like they didn't want her to succeed then a uh, big night Boris Johnson came around he's going to save the whole situation so I guess it's about time to finish it so hopefully well hopefully it will be peaceful and with a deal everything can change very quickly it it also depends on if he really follows his promise like it's not a one day decision if say everything is ready if the uh, country is ready yeah, if the economy is ready yes why not i think this is not a good sign because i've noticed the british pound is going down regarding to um against the euro so the more they extend this political instability it harms the pound more and more and the banking system so i don't think we want to lose the value of the money of our savings so i guess it should be finished on the 31st i think if it's the last thing that boris boris does it is to bring this country out of the european union that is his one mission and he will do it and i actually trust him to do it why don't the um politician listen to the people at this moment and not um at the moment 3 years ago um cuz so many things has changed since um the brexit come out and everybody was talking about that would i vote any differently no i would still vote to remain because i believe that we are better as part of europe for business than outside of europe in terms of if there was an election what the what that may mean I think the risk we have at the moment is we would have no overall majority. I think people are so disheartened by either Labour or Conservative, whatever your political, historic political allegiance is, that we may end up with a series of either hung parliaments or scrabbled together people trying to get a majority. And the difficulty is in their own parties, they're so far apart. It's hard to understand how they'd actually get together and create a ruling majority. My vote definitely wouldn't change. In fact, I'd be drumming up people to vote out because I think it's disgusting that you know you you have a vote, you win the vote, and then the people who lose go, oh, no, we're not happy. We want to have another one. What are we going to do? The best of three? I think it's disgusting. I think it's absolutely wrong, democratically wrong, and it's it's quite. quite obvious because the people voting for it are not really democratic so they are you know the left wing are not a democratic society they 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 don't think like that they're not they're not good for business and they don't understand it and yet you know employment's the best rate we've had for years 
under David Cameron, it went down, down. It's still going down. It, it couldn't be better, you know. And you've got Labour saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. All things that are going to put unemployment up. You know, if you put up the minimum wage, you're going to raise unemployment. That's, that's, that's the result of that. People need to get on the employment ladder, even if they're not earning a great deal of money. The aim is to get there. You know, my son started um, in the film business as an intern. You know, he earned nothing. So he showed you what you need to do. You get the job you want and you aim for it. And then you'll get the income you want. You know, he earns good, good wages now. But he worked for a year and a bit on virtually nothing. I know it's easy to say for me and say, oh, you could keep your son. But most people who've got parents that they've grown up with, who kept them anyway, they need to, you know, life, the whole way we take employment and the whole way we build our careers needs to be changed slightly from what it was 20, 30 years ago or in 1973. Well, from what I've seen so far, I think loads of people were misled before the first referendum. So I guess a few people might have changed their mind by now. So they would probably vote otherwise. But then I find it a bit, I don't know, I don't know. What if it's the other answer? Well, what if the referendum will be for stay in? What's going to happen then? I think the possibility of a second referendum is diminishing. I think what might happen is, I think there's almost inevitably going to be another general election within the next 12 months. I think what you might find, it's far from certain, but what you might find is once we've had a no-deal Brexit, the consequences will become more clear and then you'll find that people will vote against the Brexit parties. What you might find is that Europe may be open to a renegotiation of opening up uh, uh, access to the EU again, but these are really uncertain times. From my own part, I voted to remain last time and I would vote to remain this time as well. Normally, at this point in a documentary, I would be trying to reach a conclusion. But is there one? I mean, we have no idea what could happen. Will we actually leave on October the 31st? Who knows? According to Prime Minister Boris Johnson, we will. However, there is a possible vote of no confidence and his stay at 10 Downing Street could be very short. Indeed, there could even be a general election and the Remain parties could win a majority. Maybe we will not leave at all. Many of the people I talk to are worried. Only time will tell how justified those worries are. I mean, Cameron said, it's time for a new captain to take over this ship. And I think that they are cruising this ship straight into the iceberg. 